The Fuji Cast is an independent loading zone production. I had a weird conversation the other day, actually, Kev. Um, and I may regret actually mentioning this right at the start of the show, but hell, let's just go for it. Um, a guy that we both know called Danny. Danny. Who, who does now listen to the podcast, I believe. But um, he's a videographer who's, who I very much admire. Actually. I love his work. I like him. I like his wife. And I've worked with them both. And um, we, we, we met at a, at a wedding, wedding open day that we're, we're both suppliers for. And, um, and we were talking about podcasts. And he said to me, uh, oh, yeah, you've got a podcast, haven't you? I said, yeah, it's called The Fuji Cast. And he went, ugh. Mm. <laughs> I wouldn't listen to that <laughs> because he's a he's a cannon shooter at the moment, and um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I was trying to talk to him about this whole thing about about names and and whether, whether they're really important or not, and whether Fuji Cast is. And he said, "Well, if your problem you've got is is the name. It's called the Fuji Cast." And we've been having this debate now for about a month, maybe two months, on whether we should just call it the Kevin Neal Show. <laughs> and we decided that that would both sound like complete... Don't be rude. If we, <laughs> if we were to do that that kind of thing. So I think, you know, we're just going to st- stick with it, unless anybody has a, has a better suggestion. I think we should call it the Glasgow Lee Appreciation Society podcast. Be, yeah, nobody would understand why, but that would be a really mm. hip and trendy title, mm. wouldn't it? Yeah. Something that's got nothing to do with photography. Yeah. Yeah. That's it. That's it. Glasgow Lee show. Glasgow Lee, <laughs> the GLS. <laughs> yeah, he'd, he'd take us to court or something like that. So, and I just wanted to point out. So, so thank you, Danny, for your for your valid feedback on the on the name of the show. Um, and I'm glad that you you enjoyed the couple of episodes you have listened to. And he said, the thing is, you say that it's not about Fuji anyway, so I call it Fuji. Why well, call it anything? Oh, I know. Oh, listen, it's it's a tough thing. Call it's it number tough... number forty two. That's the meaning of life, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> I don't know any other podcast called. This is, yeah. called this is way too philosophical. It's yeah. way too early. Um, but but I, another interesting thing: the Bake Off. There was a an, an, a, a poll done, and I can't remember the figures, so I apologise off the bat. But um, from from this bit of research done, it turned out that a, a huge proportion of those that watch Bake Off actually can't bear baking, don't cook, like me, can't cook, and and uh, but they still watch it because they they quite enjoy the format of the show. So. <laughs> And actually, you just you call it the Bake Off, What's and it's it called? Not, it's called the Great British Bake Off, isn't British it? G B B B O or just something. Bake Off, isn't it? No, it's not. But that's become it's become a um, popularity popular way of referring to it. All oh, right, yeah. So you know what they should call it? Fuji Cast or something. <laughs> the Fuji Cast. <laughs> Make any difference at all. Anyway, welcome to the show. Thank you to our friends at Simpler Straps for letting us give away a simpler camera strap each to our favourite email questions of the week. We have one each to give away this week. Great thing about Simpler is that they're proportion and made for smaller pro-grade cameras. Max function, minimal bulk, quick adjusting, non-metal hardware that won't scratch your camera and glass. Go to Simpler, S-I-M-P-L-R dot U-S to see what these things look like. They're apparently also Boris proof. I'm not quite so sure about that. (laughs) Um, There's your questions about anything Fujifilm or photography related, technical, artistic, business, personal. If you have a question, send them in to click at fujicast.co.uk. The guest this week is Andrzej Vakek, um, who is. I first became aware of Andrzej through um, uh, through Sean Tucker, mm-hmm. and he interviewed Andre Andrzej, isn't it? Andrzej, you got it. It's a, it's a sort of um, not silent J, but sort of a soft J. And um, he's the guy that decided, under his own steam and under his own money, to go to war zones. He went to Ukraine <laughs> to, to you know conflict zones, mm. battle zones. Um, to report on the stories. His wife doesn't like it very much, it no. must be said. But um, So that's our, our guest today. Right, let's start with the questions then. I have one from... I like the way you've become ready. We're back in the normal studio this week, and Kev's, Kev's gone. He's got his coffee there, he's reclining. <laughs> Do you want one of the whiskeys at the back? I'm relaxing too much. I'm relaxing <laughs> way too much. This is from Andy Parslow, and he says, Hi, chaps, I just want to send a message to say how much I love the podcast, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> I even find myself talking back to you on the odd occasion. Oh, that's says, the first sign that, of madness. That is the it? first sign, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, anyway, I had a little ple- pleasure of meeting Kevin a couple of years ago when I attended the Fujifilm tryout day for the X100F in London. Oh, God, I remember those. That time, they released the X100F. They said to me, Kev, can you do us a favour? Yeah. I was like, yeah, sure. Um, here's 21 prototype cameras in a case could you take them 
all around the country and do three photo walks every single day in a pretty much a different city. And everybody had one of the new cameras. I had to take the cameras off, give them to people and take them off them and stuff like that. Um, so you had to count them all out and count them all back again. I did. Brian Hanrahan fashion. I did. Yeah. I was in, I think I went to Birmingham, I went to Cheltenham, did I any, went to any of them London. Got, any of them get nicked? Or? No, 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 okay. no, no. And one of the, I think James was with me for part of the time in London. Yeah. Uh, James from Future Film, but yeah, that was hardcore dragging those cameras around London yeah, on the tube yeah, in one yeah. of those those rolly bags that with wheel missing. <laughs> oh man! Anyway, yeah, uh, like pushing around. Uh, I always get the shopping basket at, uh, at Sainsbury um, that just doesn't have the the one, one of the wheels isn't isn't positioned correctly. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But then you kind of think, but I'm going with this. Yeah, I've got. I'm not changing it. No, you can't go and put it all in a different shopping basket. No. That just looks ridiculous. Yeah. Anyway, Andy goes on to say, uh, that was a good day out, thank you, and it was good to meet you there, Andy. Uh, you had an email from a guy from Australia recently about shooting a family occasion whilst being a guest, and I have done something similar. Ah. I used just an X100T, uh, okay, and found it to be the perfect camera for such occasions. I put the images in a blog, which I have attached to the link below. Well, so, here's the, I've just called oh. the blog up here. Okay. Yeah. If you're looking for this, by I'll give you a long um, URL, but you can write this down, I'm sure. Adphotography.me forward slash blog one forward slash Tony dash Elaine dash 50th dash anniversary. Why don't I just put that into the show yeah. notes? Yeah, we'll have that in the show notes. Don't worry. <laughs> that would have been uh, easier. And we might use tiny URL as well or something. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, why make life easy? Yeah, absolutely. This is yeah. great work, isn't it? I'm just looking through it now. Should we do a little crit on it? Yeah, it's really nice, isn't it? I yeah. like. Do you know one one thing that um, occurs to me straight away is he's not he's not shooting everything. I oh, know he is actually. Are you shooting everything at your at, at five foot ten or however high you are? Because there's. What well, are you talking to me or Andy? Because Andy. Andy's not here. Well, he, but he often says he answers back to the radio. So. Oh. So I just wonder if I if I communicate with him right now, he'll be talking back. Nobody else can hear him, but Andy knows. <laughs> <laughs> These are good pictures, I have to say. I like the way he's using the light rather than um, yeah. than working against it. Definitely, and you can tell he's not just running around and taking ten thousand pictures. They're difficult. These kind of events, aren't they? Because um, I, I'm I'm shooting a an 80th wedding. Uh, sorry, 80th wedding anniversary. That would be highly unlikely. An 80th birthday in a couple of weeks' time, and the uh, the instruction is to to gather photographs of guests eating and talking and usually at a wedding usually at a wedding that's the bit that I think oh, there's not going to be much emotion here I wonder what it's going to be like but for, for for this particular gig it's going to be the entire fuel well yeah if that's all that's happening because yeah. it's a family event then you've got no choice but yeah I, ne I never photographed the the feed-in frenzy at a wedding I have to say um but these are lovely though aren't they so what we're seeing is a 100% black and white um <laughs> it's uh Tony and Elaine's 50th wedding anniversary they yeah. don't look old enough for that do they no not them? at all they've, they've they've weathered well and uh yeah a couple of kind of really nicely laid out group shots but mm. mostly candid yeah really beautiful yeah well done. Yeah, they'll love those. But more importantly, do you do the many future generations will love those. Do you do many? Yes, that's important. Do you do many gigs like this? I have done a couple of. I, I've got a very long-winded story, which I'm not going to go into, about an 80th birthday party. Right. Um, which turned out to have. Um, it's not going to be another one of your death stories, is it? No, no. but it, it, there goodness. was. Um, there was links to the Beatles, the Rolling Stones, oh. David Hearn, Magnum, oh. and, and quite a lot of other. Very right. Oh, um, Genesis and so it's quite a show busy one. LinkedIn, not LinkedIn. What's that band? I don't know. What's that band? It's LinkedIn like Park, mid, mid, isn't it? LinkedIn Park, LinkedIn Park, LinkedIn Park. <laughs> LinkedIn Park. <laughs> <laughs> That'd be like that lovely <laughs> Facebook stones, a ro ro rolling Facebook. Uh, oh, look, if they're not in the hit parade, I don't understand <laughs> the it. Hit I, don't, I didn't, they were very confusing anyway. There was something like that, but yeah, I, I mean, I, I, I had an email the other day actually asking me to go and do something like that, yeah. Uh, my first, my first. In, That's probably why I've got it now because you turned it down. <laughs> my first, my first reaction to those kind of things generally is mm, no. Um, for the reason of. For the reason of, I don't just really think that it's going to be me but saying yeah. that looking at andy's stuff there yeah that's definitely that's definitely something i would like to have got my teeth into um i think sometimes as well it's easy to forget as a photographer you think well the pictures aren't going to have high emotion in them then there's not a lot of, there's no hugathon yep. going on here but it's all about the characters and remembering the people that were there alive on that day exactly and and who if you have those kind of opinion those thoughts who are you thinking about are you thinking are you actually thinking it's like you're making a fearless award yeah, well exactly so this is what i was about to say you know i mean i'm looking 
looking at Andy's pictures here, and I'm, you know, I'm sure he won't mind me saying that not every single one of them is going to win a, an award, but yeah. uh, by and large, I'd be very proud of every single one of them myself. Um, but it's not about that, is it? You're, you know, what I was, I was um, at a conference uh, festival a couple of days ago, yeah. weeks ago, yeah. whenever it was. Uh, and um, world, world, and the uh, message the message in my talk was uh, your pictures don't have to be good they just have to be important yeah and that's that's, that's yeah. the important thing you know yeah. the important thing the pictures don't need to be good they need to be important and in this case these are very important uh, and actually good as well but there's so one there's double one, bo- whammy bonus there's one frame here um, I don't know fifth sixth seventh down or whatever it is where you've got two relatives just flicking through old wedding albums here. That doesn't that tell you how important having all your pictures in some sort of tangible receptacle is? Anyway, yeah, Ta- well, I don't think I've ever heard you say tangible receptacle before. Yeah, well, that's. <laughs> but, you say, but yeah, no, you're absolutely it's correct. You're it? absolutely right. Rece- and, receptacle. And you're not. You're never going to see all the people who don't have books. Yeah, they're not going to have that chance there because they ain't going to print them themselves. They're going to stick them on a USB, which is going to get lost. Have a book. Yeah. Right. Well done. Thank you, Andy. Thank you. Good uh, pictures. Kind of starting with with. Uh, we're not really starting with questions this week. We, we're starting with a few uh, emotional um, things. Um, th- this came in. Did you know your wife had written in? By the way, no? which one? What, what, the first one. The first one or the current one? No, the current. <laughs> the current Mrs. The, I can't believe you've just said that. She'll be at home. No, yeah, that's it. You're in trouble. Just listening to the latest podcast whilst getting the kids sorted for school, I'll be heard Kev, I, i.e. Dad, answering a question about being unseen at weddings. He says, Mum, Dad's a dream crusher. OK, Albs, why? Well, he said being invisible is impossible and not a thing. So there you go, Mullins. This is the words of your wife, by the way. There you go, Mullins. Husband, father, photographer, Columbo impersonator, <laughs> dream crusher. But she did put here hashtag proud wife. So, ah, oh, uh, see. And she does. That's how she called me, by the way, Mullins. Mullins. Oh, yeah, she does, actually. That's she does she call me Mullins. Calls yeah, yeah, Mullins. That's, that's true. But then another couple of things. Gemma's fan club is building, by the way. So, uh, Gemma. <laughs> <laughs> you, no, don't be like that. You've got a fan club. So, this is. Uh, uh, John St. John, who, who wrote in, just wanted to comment on an earlier episode, the one where um, Neil interviewed Kevin's wife, Gemma. This interview made my eyes almost get moist. I'm sure it's just that time of year, isn't it? There's dust in the air. It, it reminded me of your Steve Shipman interview. I commented, oh, yes, uh, the Steve Shipman one. I commented on your YouTube interview with uh, with him when he drifted off describing his wife and you see i think she did the same thing for you Gemma sort of drifted off and mm. and described you um, uh, the i did actually the steve shipman one in case you've never heard it i made a youtube film about steve shipman mm. who's this um, incredibly generous beautiful man mm. who is no longer with us and um he died last year didn't he and I, yeah it was last year i remember it last yeah, year i remember was, being we were meant to be in brighton that's so i was on the funeral time yeah, that's right. We were in Brighton so at the day uh, of the funeral. So it would have been June last so it year. It was June last year. And mm. I remember getting the news when I was on Greenham Common with a family. It was a Saturday, very, very rare Saturday. I wasn't working at a wedding. And his friend called me to say that he'd passed. But the, I, I, I made a, a video with Steve um, a year previous to that. And um, I asked Steve to describe his wife. And I think that's, well, I know that's what John St. John is. And I, I, I excuse the. Um, well, it doesn't doesn't feel like self indulgence because it's Steve's words here. But the, the, I don't know if you're interested. But this is I remember asking Steve what does because it was all about what does a wife you know how does she glue the family together mm. and as a photographer what does she mean to you? So th- this is well this was the question. What is it about Amanda? <laughs> <laughs> She's very strong wise woman. We talk a lot. We walk and talk a lot. It's something we've always done, with or without a dog. We've walked and talked. And that's the strength, I think, of our relationship. We just talk through everything. We always have done. What is it about her? She's a very wise, understanding, considerate and patient person. She's kept us together as a family. She's the glue that does hold us together. She's an absolute pillar of strength for the girls. And she's the rock for me. I mean, that was uh, that was what John was talking about, that excerpt mm. from the film. But he goes on to say, I felt similar emotion this time round. The love, the pride, the understanding Gemma had for Kev is wonderful. 
and uh, yeah, that came across in spades, obviously, for John. And then we had another one, Sasha Miller. Look, they all came flooding in. I know, Sasha. Firstly, can Gemma be on every week? <laughs> <laughs> Thoroughly enjoyed that episode. Really brave, honest interview. I think all businesses and sole traders have their ups and downs, and I would say most creatives suffer from imposter syndrome. We've talked about yeah, this a lot, haven't we? Do you, do, do you still suffer from yeah. that? Yeah, 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 yeah. When will, when will somebody actually say to me, what the hell, what are you doing here? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And then if that wasn't enough, I thought, oh, surely that must be the end of this now. Another one came in, David Kovacs. Hi, gents. Sincere, heartfelt thank you for the honest, direct and uh, enjoyable approach to photography. I really enjoy the podcast where you interviewed da, 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 Gemma. <laughs> <laughs> the love and adoration with which she spoke was so genuine. It was. In- Did you have somebody write these in for you or something? It was inspiring. From from this is from uh, David in in Michigan in, in the United States. So there we are. Put you in the everybody loves Kevin pile. Just mm, no Gemma. No Gemma. Yeah. Loves, uh, everybody, and everybody loves. loves no everybody loves Gemma. Mm. <laughs> Gemma, come on, don't be that. No, no need to be Less like that. Up. Right, let's get to some actual questions, shall we? Right, okay. Um, I will go with... Uh, I have a question, I believe, because yeah. um, I haven't actually <laughs> yeah. read it, yeah. from Phil... We're, we're, we're 10, 12 minutes into the show, whatever. We haven't actually had Phil, a question yet. Phil Hindmore. <laughs> All right, okay. Uh, friend, of, uh, friend of podcast a couple of weeks ago. Love the gentle leg pulling and good humour between the two of you. Just like an enjoyable chat down a pub. I know you like questions, lifeblood of the show, and all that stuff. I have an X-T3 body with some of the Fujifilm primes. I use an X-T1 as a backup. For shooting an event or wedding, I wondered about putting a prime on each body, 23 or 16 or one on one, or 56 on the other, maybe. Whilst I love my old X-T1, I haven't really done a side-by-side compare of the images output... Oh, out, output t- pics taken at the same event yet. I'm worried that it is an older x trans sensor on the X-T1, and it will be shown up by the pics on the X-T3. I suspect that it won't be noticeable unless someone is pixel peeping, as I know that the X-T1 is still a great sensor, especially since most of the pictures would be viewed on a phone, or perhaps printed up to 16 by 12 maybe. So, should I be worried about this or not? Um, so I'm not... Um, you picked the longest question. Yeah, and I'm not... Yeah. I'm kind of... Un- anyway, that's the end of this week's show. Yeah. <laughs> Bye-bye. <laughs> well, so the question, I think, is, yeah. is the X-T1 different to the X-T3? Yes, that's... Yeah. That's uh, what I pulled from it. And the answer is yes. And and the answer Very is... much. Actually, yeah, it's noticeably different, actually. X-T1 to X-T3, there's a, there's a, that's a, a huge difference in sensors. There's not only just the sensor size, but the pixel density, the noise handling. Yeah, it will... Uh, I can usually tell the difference between an image. A JPEG, this is straight from yeah. X-T1 and, and X-T3. So, uh, yeah, I mean, this doesn't mean... Just because there's a better camera, i.e. the X-T3, it doesn't mean the X-T1 is a bad camera no, just it's, means it's not as good as the one that's yeah. come after it i think in low light terms if the xt1 for me was in particularly low light situations you, you, it was like photographing into a snowstorm in the evening yeah yeah the low light stuff in the was, wasn't good was at improved all. a lot yeah. in the xt2 the XT3, sure. amazing uh yeah so um yeah i mean stick primes on it absolutely i would do something like i'd go for the 23 perhaps or 16 on the xt3 and the 56 on the xt1 because you get that extra stop of light then on yeah. the, the 1.2 lens um so yeah that's it i was reading all about the apd sensor the other day yeah and i wonder why I, I i didn't go for it and then of course it's it's a lot slower as a focusing lens isn't it uh, i wouldn't say it's a lot slower it is noticeably so slower not sensor sorry i mean lens but it's definitely a portrait lens you yeah. get you get amazing sort it, of creamy fall off with the bo- bokeh 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 how do they pronounce that I word? don't know I, once, I was once in Japan and of course it's a Japanese word right is it yeah, and, oh, we've said about this. And I was we? speaking yeah. to yeah. one of the uh, one of the Japanese people, and uh, and we were having this conversation about. He was trying to explain it to, to me in English. Yeah, and he didn't use the word bokeh he, or boka. He was. What did he use? He was going uh, background back, background blurriness. <laughs> back, he said, "How <laughs> do you technical. how do you say background blurriness?" And I said, "Boka." He went. Boca? He went, really? Yeah. <laughs> I went, yeah. He said, that's what we say. <laughs> oh, um, okay, Boca, however it's pronounced. Anyway. Tomato, tomato. I just say background blurriness now. Yeah. <laughs> that, that out of focus bit, I love that bit. Yeah, that uh, bit in the back. Yeah, that is. Whatever. Uh, Tommy Vessel um, from Colorado. 
Hi, Neil. Hi, Kev. In a recent episode of The Fuji Cast, um, or 42 as we m- might rename it, I think I heard uh, Kevin deals with... Uh, do you mind me mentioning this, by the way? No, you've talked about it. With gout on occasion. I t- I too have gout, and it strikes once or twice a year in my foot. The pain is terrible. I can't walk and only manage to hardly hobble around. Mm. Kev, has your, out, uh, has your gout ever interfered with your professional work? Have you had a gout attack while at a wedding? What do you do? I quite literally feel your pain. This is this is not a kit question. This is a humanity question, or human question. Human endeavours question? Well, the first time I ever had it at a wedding, mm. I, I was staying in a and b in North Wales because I was photographing a wedding at... Merthyr? No, <laughs> North Wales. Um, oh, where's Merthyr? I thought it was North. Uh, no, Merthyr's South Wales Valleys. Um, All right, sorry. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> okay. You, you can, it's the place with a big fence around it. <laughs> where's the place where the prisoner was filmed? Um, oh, that was that amazing Port Merion. Port Merion. Merion. That was yeah, it, that's Port Merion. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. I had a wedding at Port Merion and um, I, I woke up in the, in the middle of the night with my foot the size of a football and oh I it literally struck you overnight i couldn't put my foot down oh, and no. i had to get i was staying in a bnb and i had to go and say to the lady in the bnb in the morning could you i'm really sorry but could you go to the chemist mm-hmm. and i got her to get me a uh, neurofen and paracetamol and you you shouldn't really mix Tell these you didn't things put them together yeah i did i did every two hours uh, and this is not advisable folks every two hours i took uh, yeah hang on a minute warning each. warning do not listen to this as any kind of medical advice no so let's just say I took some medis- medication yeah. and um, it, it kind of alleviates it a bit. But yeah, it does. It really bloody hurts. Like, yeah, yeah, really yeah. hurts. Yeah. And it, I've had it a few times at work. I, I get it like once or twice a year also. Um, what What normally? I don't know. They they reckon it's like Henry VIII used to get it apparently. And it's if you eat fine cheese and drink too much red wine or something. Well, Henry VIII, it, I mean, nothing was necessarily fine cuisine. I mean, Henry VIII wasn't spotted down Waitrose getting fine cheese at the cheese counter, no, was he? No, but I don't think he did too much for in terms of uh, like taking on bulb water and stuff. So it's it's all, ultimately it's, uh, it's uric acid crystallizing on your bones and it usually manifests itself down on your your joints of your toes and your toe bones connected to you Uh, uh, my pain (laughs) my pain bone it is seriously i had a doctor once on my uh, an orthopedic surgeon on one of my workshops and he said that um get a true gout if you get true gout is considered one of the most in the top five painful things you can get that's a non-invasive i.e it's not a cut or or an operation or a hit over the head or something like naturally occurring thing but you've never missed a wedding because of it no 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 i've never missed a wedding my god no just hobbled around yeah i mean i i I, would people notice do you think yeah generally people come up to me and say what's wrong with your foot is that the worst thing that you've ever had that could have been a problem at a wedding with in in terms of medical conditions yeah i think so have you have you worked at one with a flu i did once have because i get really bad hay fever and i once did a wedding at the four seasons in hampshire and they well, had, that's a nice venue, though. It is lovely. Yeah. They had more lilies than you could oh, shake no. a field oh, at. Seriously. Oh, no. And my, my head exploded. I had... Did it? Uh, it practically felt like my eyes were bleeding. I was oh, sneezing word. everywhere. Yeah. I, I, you know, and it t- totally took me by surprise, so I didn't take any kind of um, pyritin or anything with me. Mm. And, um, of course, you say to the, the wedding planner, you know, I don't suppose you've got any antihistamine. Well, I have, but, you know, elf and safety can't give you anything. No, I know. Sorry. No, they never can, can they? Yeah. I'm like, all right, I'll just continue to die. Do you know, I had that situation with uh, with our Jack, our eldest, Jack. We went to a karting event um, earlier this year because he, he loves his racing, F1 and karting and stuff like that. So we went to a karting event, and um, this particular um, race venue is surrounded by trees. You can walk, walk pretty much around the whole um, the, the whole track. And he got stung by a wasp. He leant on a wasp, and he got stung. Mm. And um, we went to the St. John's Ambulance. And uh, we said, uh, have you got any antihistamine or any antihistamine cream? Now, you would have thought in an ambulance, okay, that's dealing with people whose legs may be hanging off after a race, that they might have antihistamine. He said, no, no, can't can't give you stuff like that. I thought, what are you talking about, man? You're a... You're a first aider. And the, the St John's ambulance. You're a medic. Give him a John, polo. St John's ambulance are meant to be the, the, the you know the ambulance for the public, not meant to, like if somebody had a nasty accident know, on the mot- on the um, racetrack, they'd yeah. get a proper ambulance. Yeah, absolutely. Well, uh, no, no, that's the. Don't be rude. No, because they are they they are the proper ambulance, aren't they? No. Oh, they're not. If somebody, <laughs> if you have a head-on crash on that road, yeah, they're going to do dial nine nine nine, and the, your your fellows with the yellow and blue lights will turn up. 
Uh, your St. John's ambulance people are the people who bless them. They're yeah. all it's all for charity and uh, they're, sorry, it's all um, uh, vo- uh, vocational and they are a. Um, are they all they're, voluntary? They're vo- voluntary and they're derived, I believe, they're derived from the Knights of St. John from um, Malta. Good job. So the wealth so, of St. John's Cross in yeah, Malta. Yeah. And oh, I never knew that was the cross. Yeah, and that's I think, where the cross comes. I from. think so. Well, it's the Maltese cross, and it's re- related to the Knights of St John. Right. And um, Caravaggio, the painter, was a Knight of St John. It was the thing that saved him from being beheaded. This, I mean, this week's been like a history lesson, and we're not, we're not even. I might be totally wrong about that, the show. but I'm fairly sure yeah. that's right. right. Anyway, um, yeah, so they would, they're the ones that will kind of make a cup of tea and stuff like that for, for you, <laughs> if you really need it. No, you are being rude. No, I'm not, honestly. I remember being with uh, wife number one at a concert once, and she sure fainted, that, and really? I had to carry her. It was a uh, Steve Earle concert, and mm. it was really good. And then she fainted, um, ruined it. And I had Is that to, why you divorced her? <laughs> I, literally, I literally picked her up, put her over my shoulder, and, and, and I was panicking because I'd never never seen her faint before and in yeah. the end you know she she kind of happened to a few times but i picked her up threw over my shoulder and was like running aimlessly around thinking what do you i don't know what to do everybody else was just carrying on listening to copperhead road <laughs> and i was running around with this this girl over my shoulder and um and in the end i found the st john's ambulance place left her there and uh, no, he made her a cup of tea. Oh right, okay. he made her. Cu- he sat down. And he made her a cup of tea. And you got to see the rest of the gig, right? This week's guest, Andres Vakek. We'll come back with more questions. I promise. It's not been a very question-rich first part of the show. Um, Andres Vakek um, is uh, an incredible chap. He he doesn't live here anymore. He lives back in Prague, and uh, but he lived for a long long time in London. Still comes back to to, to work weddings and things like that over here. And um, I was first made aware of him through Sean Tucker and a film that Sean made about um, Andrzej and, and, and the work that he does in conflict zones. Mm. And, and it's not work that he's been hired for, commissioned for, like you heard on the show last week mm. uh, with our guest. This is work where he's put himself, I, I guess, in the line of fire. And so this is uh, our chat this week with Andrzej Vaka. I, I want to dig back into your blog for a second because because um, there's some great stories in there. I, I revealed a really interesting piece titled, and it's quite a newish piece. It's not about the likes. And Andre, I I wanted to openly cheer in the streets. Um, let let me uh, say what you wrote. You wrote, "What is photography?" And I don't mean the chemical process of film emulsion or the digital way of recording light using pixels. What does photography mean to you? So I'm going to I'm going to bat that question straight back to you and ask you what what does photography mean to you? Storytelling of kind of life in general. Whenever I aim a camera, I'm just trying to tell a story of that specific moment in time. And do you think that people do invest too much of their time in in likes and wa- oh, yeah. wanting to be liked? Do, do, how does that make you feel as a photographer? I'm trying not to think about it too much. I'm trying to curb social media in my life more and more recently. Like a couple of months ago, I've deleted my Facebook completely. Mm. I'm just on Instagram now, just posting once a day just to keep it going. But I tend not to think about it too much. Sean had a really nice uh, point about it recently in his video Mm. when he was saying like, you have amazing photographers that have 50 followers and three likes per picture. And then you have absolutely crap photographers who have thousands and thousands of followers and likes. The likes don't matter. So actually, it would be a good thing as far as you're concerned if Instagram one day did take that that uh, numerical out of the equation. It just depresses you when you, for example, you're used to, let's say, 500 likes per mm. picture. And suddenly they change an algorithm a little bit. And suddenly you're only getting 100 likes per picture. Yeah. And you're thinking to yourself, like, what am I doing wrong? Yeah. If you don't have the number there... Yeah, you don't worry about that. Now, generally, it doesn't take me long to find the about page or history or narrative about a photographer. If I like their pictures and I like yours, clearly, I, I want to know the story about the story maker. Uh, and you're you're a very multi-layered person. On the one hand, there's you as what we could almost call an archetypal sort of social photographer. You shoot weddings, shoot portraits, a section on landscapes, beautiful landscapes, by the way, and and mm-hmm. and street. But for me, and um, it's the Forgotten War and the Frozen War pages that show me a, a very different side to you. And that's, that's what I'm fascinated to learn more about today. Because as I understand it, you, you invest your own money to travel and you invested your own money to travel to Ukraine and, and to areas that have been war-torn for quite some time and real areas of un- unrest. 
And I want to know why. Because when I'm doing something like this, that's probably, and it kind of sounds sad, it's probably the only time when I'm feeling like I'm not wasting my time. That's when I actually feel like I'm doing something that I actually think is useful or it makes sense or has kind of some kind of purpose for me. Are you saying that the social work you do, we're never denigrating, of course, the, the brides that we work for or the people that we, we photograph in portraits, but are you saying somehow that that doesn't fulfill you as, as much, perhaps? Um, weddings, I like. I, I kind of like shooting weddings. They're, and I know you've talked about this on the podcast a lot. It is like street photography, where you have full-on permission from everyone to photograph. So you don't have the anxiety of, oh, should I get close to that stranger? Mm. On a wedding, that's not a problem. So it's like street photography. It is storytelling, but it's actually easier than street photography to me. A lot easier. So take me right back to the start. You made a decision. You self-funded yourself. I know you're particularly inspired by the likes of Sir Don McCullin. But tell me how, how you started out on this road to, to get to where you needed to be to tell those stories. Uh, well, it started long ago. I was maybe 15, 16 when my brother got me a Patrick Chavel's book, a War Reporter. And I just ate that book up in like two days. I just read through the whole thing. And as the time progressed, I got into photography, but you know, it was nothing too specific, nothing too special, nothing too specific. And I kind of fell out of photography, gave up on it for a couple of years. And eventually I figured that I wanted to do photography more, but I wanted to mean more. So I wanted to get more into storytelling and I wanted to start with street photography. That was actually when I got my first Fuji. It was about six years ago. Yeah, because you're a Fuji shooter. And we, we will come on to that. So that was six yeah. years ago. You were, you were street shooting. But but taking it the one step further to to then put yourself in a effectively a war zone. I mean, that that's, yeah. that's a whole different leap of faith. I really wanted to give conflict photography a try. Mm. Not necessarily the war and guys shooting guns and explosions. More of the actual human side of war. Uh, but I knew that I just cannot go into a war zone and start taking pictures because I'm going to get myself killed. Absolutely. And I'm probably going to get people around me killed. So I went to a course first. There's this really good conflict photography course happening in Spain that was in every Spain, year. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's actually run by uh, one of ex-photographers as well, Eric Bouvet. I'm pretty sure Kevin knows him. And that course, it was just a week-long course. When the course starts, they told us that there is two types of people on the course. Those who will just find out after it's finished that this is not for them. And this was pre pretty much their test without getting injured. And then the other people who actually really want to do it afterwards. So I'm, I'm intrigued as to what they teach on this course. I mean, are, are the, are the practicalities of what happens if somebody's injured? Or, or is it technical skills? Or is it social skills, language? What, what do they teach? There was a lot of technical skills, a lot of um, logistics as well. First of all, how not to get injured and how not to get anyone around you injured, but if you do, how to handle it, how to manage it. It was uh, it was pretty hands-on. Uh, so we did have to tourniquet guys that were injured, that lost limbs. We had to help people out of a uh, minefield. Mm. Uh, we had to navigate firefights and battles. Uh, we had to carry injured people under fire, all that kind of stuff. So it was really... Really well done scenarios. And are these skills you've you've subsequently had to uh, put into to practice and use in, in the real theatre? Some of them, yeah. Fortunately, uh, when I when I was in the war zone, well, it was a pretty calm time when I was there. In winter, there was really not much happening. That was the frozen in war, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. Exactly. In summer, before there was some gunfire and explosions happening, and there were some well, quite a lot of mines around. The 23 and 35, now I've heard you talk about this in uh, an interview. Um, you were shooting uh, with longer focal lengths, um, but now you've gone gone wide. Uh, and of course, if we if we take it right back to the, the, you know, the famous words of Robert Capper, if your pictures aren't good enough, you're not close enough until his unfortunate demise. But um, but you're, you're actually practicing that aren't you you're you're not shooting on long focal lengths you say you leave the 56 behind quite a lot often often i do but there are days where i just can't, don't feel it with wide angle lenses or the 35 mil and i just put the 56 on and that's the day when i really get some good shots 
and then I go back to wide angle. So the 56 usually picks me up. I always that, that lens always makes me feel good. Yeah, I love that 56. It feels a really good lens, doesn't it? And, oh, and yeah. actually, since we're talking about Fujifilm, you are a Fuji shooter. And that's not, not the reason necessarily we're talking to you because <laughs> we've talked to so many people of late that have absolutely nothing to do with the brand. And, and, that, and that's good. Uh, because it, 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 you know it might be called the Fuji cast, but we want to talk about photography. Now you've embraced Fujifilm, and and in fact you even told me before we started talking. I must share this with you at home. Um, <laughs> that you're, you're getting two kittens at the weekend, and uh, go on. You can tell the story. Well, we wanted just one kitten, but I persuaded my wife to get two so they don't get bored. <laughs> and we're gonna name one of them Fuji, and the other one Phil. <laughs> no way. And okay. I'm kind of hoping that one of them is going to be black and the other one's going to be white, <laughs> but I don't think we're going to have that luck. What, ma- what makes a strong image for you then? Three things, and I always say this over and over, and that's good light, good composition, and good story. Mm. And if it has all these three in the same shot, that's a winner. If it has at least one of them, it's still all right, two of them, that's good. But all three of them, that's a, that's a winner for me. Surrounding it back on the fact that you're often standing in um, uh, some, some awkward situations, and I know you said it's, it's fairly quiet, but there are plenty of times when you've written in your essays about having to be a bit cautious because there's, there's a sniper always waiting to have a, a, a little bit of practice on somebody. Um, are, are you able to practice all those, those, those three combinations quickly and briskly when you're working in a war zone? Well, that's one of the reasons I do street photography. For me, that's practice, street photography. You know, when you're out in the street, you have split second to get the shot and you need to get the shot right. You cannot be just crappy, just walk by, no. snap from a, from a hip, because that's what 90% of photography out there is. And you want to have it better. You know, shooting street photography for, I mean, I'm not doing it for long. I've been doing it for what, five, four years maximum, mm. like fully, all day, every day. Then when I actually get into a situation when I need to think fast and get a good shot, it's much easier because... I've had the same cameras now for more than three years. So this is the, the, the X-Pro2, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, my X-Pro2 yeah. is over three years old. Mm. And I recently got an X-T2, which I just upgraded from X-T1. And you are proof that, that um, I mean, you were talking about an X-Pro2. There's an X-Pro3 on the way, as we well know now. Yeah. Uh, and you've gone for, from the X-T1 to the X-T2, but you, you've not gone for the X-T3. It's very interesting because a lot of people want to have all the latest gear, the newest gear. You're not that kind of photographer, are you? Oh, no, no. I was just recently listening to your episode on gas, and I was pretty happy with myself that that's one thing I definitely don't have. I'm happy with the gear I've got. I know my camera inside out. If I needed to do something, I know exactly what to do, where to reach without having to think about any new second setting that's there or that, does this camera do this? Why, is, why are these buttons different? And black and white is your medium of choice. It makes sense when it's storytelling, I know, but it, is that the reason why there's it's, it's, it, there's not much colour in your life in, in photography? <laughs> I was thinking recently, I wish I could say I'm colourblind, right. but I'm not. I actually can see colour pretty well. So it just feels right to me in black and white. That's where I really enjoy the composition and the light more. I find colour distracting. It's yeah. usually the same with movies. I tend to watch movies more in black and white. Like the recently, the, when Logan came out, the black and white edition was absolutely amazing. That was much better than the yeah. color. Yeah. J- Jim Mortram, actually, um, who we interviewed a uh, well, good, good few months ago, he said of being asked about black and white, why, why he showed all these images in black and white, he said, do you want to know the truth about this? He said, uh, my monitor was broken and would only show black yeah, and white. So. <laughs> <laughs> and, and it's an absolute true story. So um, this self-funding thing, somewhere, somehow, you had to fund your travels to these places. So you've done the course, which I can't imagine was cheap. Um, you've travelled to, to Ukraine. H- how have you done this? Well, I had a dirt cheap rent in London when I still lived there at the time when I was doing the Ukraine trip. And I was saving saving up. I was saving up for maybe a year or two just to pay all the expenses. The second trip was a lot cheaper because I already had most of my gear that I needed. And I didn't actually pay for a fixer anymore. So that mm. saved up a lot of money as well. well I'm glad you mentioned the, the fixer because in the Forgotten War essay on your website, you talk about, is it Mar- uh, Mar- uh, Marichka is the name I wrote down, yeah. the fixer, yeah, yeah. who linked you up one particular collective of volunteer fighters. Fixer, of course, is somebody you must place a, a lot of faith in. But if you're not, if you're not using a, a fixer, um, is that a dangerous way to operate? Oh, uh, it can be, definitely. Because even with a fixer, you, you, if you, you know, if you can't trust a fixer, they can sell you to someone who offers enough money and then they wow. do whatever they want with you. If you don't have a fixer, 
and you don't speak the language or you don't have a way of moving around, you're pretty much putting yourself at mercy of the people you're with. So the fixer can be a, can, can, can be a real problem for, for anybody in the field by the sound of it. And that was me thinking that they were the, the, the problem solvers. They can actually cause the problem. Mm, yeah. I mean, if you run into a bad one, definitely. Yeah. Um, there was this journalist, uh, I think he was arrested or kidnapped. I think it was in Syria because he was sold out by his fixer. Yeah, not a position you'd want to find yourself in. How, how do the soldiers uh, deal with you? What, what are their thoughts about you being there with them on the front line? Some were pretty happy about it. Some are like, happy that the, you know, the cameras are pointed at them. There's plenty of them who actually hated it. Mm. Uh, or they were completely indifferent and just couldn't care less. Because the world has become a far, far more dangerous place for journalists. I mean, they're, they're no longer necessarily a carrier of the true story everyone wants to hear they're seen as the the carrier of a story one side may not want you to hear uh, which, yeah yeah and, and you- like when i when i was in ukraine the second time and we went to the front line they told me to take my press patches off my vest yeah because they said that might actually just make it even worse for me so yeah i did i just put them in my pocket i've heard the stories about how journalists are told though those blue helmets that they wear sometimes they're told not to have those on you know you've seen the story of mary colvin in syria absolutely yeah yeah. when she was targeted. Um, we've talked of late about mental health on the show, in particular trauma. Uh, and many of the photographers I've talked with, and, and some have been interviewed, have emerged from their lives and, and various forms of, of the front line, yet you're, run, you're running towards it. Is this the start of your career? You, are you going to do more? Well, right now waiting for how it turns out. But if it all works well, I might be heading to Syria soon. Mm. I definitely want to tell more stories like this. We often think mistakenly that all the images in stories like this should somehow reflect a, a suffering. But you know what, Andre, your, your, your pictures show life as normal as well, which I would imagine is just as important, really, in terms of the stories you tell. And some, some of the images, there, there is humour. Life, life does go on. People go to fairs. And it's, it, it's that an important side of it, do you think? Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, if people are you know, excelling at one thing, and that's always adapting to what's around them. If you live in a war zone for four or five years, you will learn to live with it. You will learn to just be yourself again. Just try to do your best to not be miserable. So that's what I saw in those older ladies that lived yeah. in the frontline village. You know, they live right in the front line. Their houses were pretty much demolished and being bombed um, like almost all the time. I'm not sure how it's going on at the moment. It's been over a year. But they still, you know, sat in front of their houses and the gardens. They just cooked, you know, on the front porch. They were just tending to their gardens or picking up peaches and fruit from the ground and from the trees. And they were just living life as if the war was not going on. And it is that classic life goes on, isn't it? Now, exactly. I know you're drawn to the work of Salgado and, of course, McCullin and various others that you mentioned already. The, these, these types of figures are hugely important and influential to you. Can we still learn from, from the great such as Sedon? What, what do we learn from them? That's tough because when you hear him now talk about the work he's done, what I take away from it is that he kind of hates that he used to be doing it, that he just wants to photograph his English landscapes right now and just forget about it. And I guess we'll never know until we actually get to that point as well, because mm. he's been through so much. I know. You know, I can't even imagine what I would do if I lived through everything he lived through. Well, he talks about the shame, doesn't he? The shame of, yeah. of, of seeing some of the things that he's seen. And, exactly. And you can see it in his work. I mean, the landscapes, they're just so dark, aren't they? And, and yeah, they are depressive, but they're still beautiful. I they are, he does yeah. it just so wonderfully. Even the work that he does in his Somerset home, where, where he's working with bowls of fruit in the corner, is that there's an intensity to them, aren't there? Yeah, yeah. Has the experience so far then impacted on your feeling about humanity? I mean, I know uh, Don McCullin is is many many decades down the road, and, and what he's seen and to have walked in his shoes. But you know, you're early on, and you have your own feelings, and you've seen stuff. Uh, it does change my worldview a bit. Yeah, like when I came back from my first trip in Ukraine, that was when I was working in Jessops, I believe. I finished my trip to Ukraine. I came home. I had about three four days at home where I just edited all the pictures, printed out all the edits, and just created a story out of all of that. And then the next Monday I go to work mm. and I have a customer asking me like, should I buy a 750D or D5300? <laughs> I was like, who gives a shit? You there didn't, are people you, dying in Ukraine yeah, right now and you're yeah. deciding between two exactly the same cameras with a different name on it. And I wondered whether you were going to say that because the, the few conflict photographers and a very dear friend of mine who we talk about far too much, I'm Giles Penn founder, a dear friend of mine, he talks about that. It's very difficult, I think, 
when when you photograph what these people have photographed and you have photographed to somehow um, uh, find a level ground when you return immediately, isn't it? Yeah, you you cannot really actually compare those situations because no. to that person in the camera shop, that is a lot of money. That is a big decision for him as well. You cannot uh, talk down to him because he's got a different set of problems to other people that are actually suffering somewhere. Mm. But it is a different kind of world, completely different world. What does your wife think of this? Oh, she hates me, you know, whenever he, she hates whenever I go somewhere. Mm. But she's already accepted that this is just what I've got to do. And I'm just miserable when I'm not doing anything like that. I'm really, really um, pleased that we were able to talk. Um, a British army officer whose wedding I covered recently gave me a little advice, Andre, when, when, when he heard of my African travels, though I was moving in safe circles in a relatively sm- safe, small West African <laughs> nation, apart from some parts of, the, of my stay there. He, he said to me, these are the words he used, he said, stay low, move fast. And that is my <laughs> bidding, that is my bidding to you. Um, you're doing incredible work. I have the greatest of, of respect and admiration for you wanting to tell these difficult stories. And uh, thank you for making time to to chat to us. Thank you. Next week on the show, travels of a very different nature. Chris Waddell talks of uh, many a day spent photographing British peers, a personal project that turned into a book. So if you're planning your own personal projects and think there may actually be a market out there for a book to flourish, I think this one's going to pique your interest. Right, back to the questions. Kev, you lead. Yep, not good for it. Steve Ford says, Hi guys, uh, what's your take on buying second-hand equipment and do you have any tips for checking the gear out before purchasing? Just crashed through the early episodes, including who you pee next to. <laughs> this is a weird episode I this actually, week, isn't it? I don't remember, do you remember that, that one. one? No. I, um, I think it came about, I was talking about, I was stood in the uh, the gents next to a couple of famous footballers. Oh, uh, yeah, I do vaguely remember. Stuart Pearce. No, I was too right. frightened to say anything to him, really. Yeah. yeah. Uh, anyway, his claim to, uh, this is Steve Ford, my claim to fame uh, yeah. was the lead singer having a pee next to the lead singer of New Order <laughs> Bernard Sumner uh, many years yeah. ago at Bristol Trinity Hall during the same check uh, he put me on the guest list <laughs> see, uh, well, things, see? That, things that come from having a, a, a comfortable wee next to somebody else if you don't ask you don't get so what's your thought please on looking on what to look for when you're buying second hand when was the last time you bought something second hand uh, I not for a little while I wouldn't be worried about buying second hand I buy, I've bought reconditioned I bought reconditioned um XH1 from the Fuji store. I would class that. Does that count in there? I would class that as the same thing. I was very confident with that because, of course, I'm assuming that uh, an engineer is going to look at it and give it a good once over. Yeah. Yeah, the refurb stuff, they, 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 and I think it comes with guarantee as well, doesn't it, for a certain period of time. I'm very pleased with it. No problems at all. I don't feel confident buying stuff from. And, and I'm, I'm very happy to buy on eBay. Mm-hmm. No issues with eBay at all. We spend quite a lot of money with eBay. Not so sure I buy a lens through it, though. Yeah, I think when it comes to eBay, I've, I haven't bought anything from there for a long, long time. But I used to, uh, in my previous life, as a, um, in other businesses. As a millionaire. Uh, in sports, <laughs> selling, uh, selling rugby programs and match one rugby jerseys and stuff. EBay oh, was, did you have a hustle? eBay was a good, uh, yeah, the sports memorabilia business. Wow. eBay was a good, a good uh, marketplace. But the, you have to put a lot of trust in the rankings, in the ratings. Mm. Um, and I know that over the, you know, that was for me, that was like 10 years ago, perhaps even more. Yeah. But the, I know that they've been fiddled a little bit these days and, you know, you can, you can get your, your fingers burned. But I think generally looking at reviews and stuff like that of a buyer or of a seller in this case would be useful. Um, a lens. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's hard because you can't tell if there's any mold or anything inside the glass elements. No, that's true. Via pictures. Yeah. Um, I would probably, if I'm interested in a secondhand lens, probably only buy it from a shop and all of them you know Cam Bryan pictures up in North Wales yeah. London Camera Exchange Wex they all have second hand um, and I'm assuming sections. all, all those people would, see. would check the, the stuff wouldn't they they'd have a closer look closer inspection yeah absolutely yeah. The, the, the retail premises the ones basically the, the retail premises that have an affiliation with um, the brands well, so if they're a Sony dealership yeah. or a Fujifilm dealership or Canon dealership or whatever you know they're, they're gonna they're not gonna be selling things that are, don't meet standards so that's probably what I would do for second-hand kind of gear. Go, MPB, go to a, a shop. One. MPB. MPB. I bought a couple of lenses through them. Very happy. Yeah. Yeah. yeah there's there's a whole of them. I, I, I personally probably wouldn't buy a lens through. I'd buy a camera through eBay. Yeah. 
but probably not a lens. Not a lens, no. Just because it's too hard to, to kind of, you know, if they think there's nothing wrong with the lens, then you turn it turns up and there's a little bit of mould or a spot of dust on the inside element. And then you say, actually, that's really important to me when I'm shooting at F22. And they yeah. don't understand what F22 is or they, they've never really noticed it. And where'd you draw the line? Yeah. Uh, you'd have to call St John's ambulance out to to, to mediate. <laughs> Don't start. No, come on, again. let's uh, let's all have a cup of tea and a polo <laughs> and a polo. <laughs> Paul, Paul Whitbread, few questions. Uh, reviews of the Fujinon 200 mm f2 seem to follow a common pattern. Kev, the reviewer falls in love with the lens, but then laments not being able to afford it. <laughs> From your interactions with the wider Fuji community, are you aware of many people actually investing in this lens? I think no. It sounds yeah. Like the well, no is the answer. Yeah. Not not. I think um, John Rock has got one. Um, he does motorsports. Yeah. Um, he's happy with it. Yeah. Well, from what I've seen, although saying that, I don't know whether he's purchased one or whether it's a loan one or what. So yeah, yeah. I've definitely seen him with it. I've seen the lens. Um, it's big and heavy, um, but it's uh, it's got an inbuilt um, extender two times double times extend everything all oh, right okay so uh or it's not inbuilt actually but it comes in the box so, so it's, then you can see people smiling from the international space station <laughs> don't you it's uh <laughs> i think it's a well yeah i mean basically i, I agree with the, the email i think it's a well-received lens very yeah. expensive but it's with gonna the ex- be. he said with the it goes on to say with the exception of the the ongoing 33 f1 saga fuji have now delivered their their x mount lens roadmap what lenses would you add to to the next roadmap are there any lenses that you would particularly like for your shooting style um, slash workflow? Conversely, are there lenses which would not necessarily be of use to you, but you think are significant gaps in the Fuji ecosystem? I'd, I'd very much like a faster ten to twenty four. You know, well, firstly, the thirty three f one isn't isn't a thing. It's not happening. Um, right, and they're going to bring out a fifty mil f one instead. When? Oh, I don't know when, but it's probably a better choice than the thirty three f one. The prototype I saw of that was. <laughs> Was as big as your, as big as your head. Was it? it was huge. Oh, thank um, you very much. Don't be rude. <laughs> <laughs> Probably weighed a little less. <laughs> How rude! <laughs> but no, it was. It was just. A, it really, was not a lens that I think. What happened with the thirty three F one story was everybody got a bit caught up with you know people the the, the X Pro two came along and the reportage and the, the F two lenses and everything and. And everybody's like, let's get a really fast 33 mil lens that we can go and do street and you know, yeah. and, and and so Fujifilm kind of run with it, got an F1 on the on the on the drawing board, and realised that it's not going to be small or light; it's going to be absolutely monstrous, yeah, yeah. and it will only really be good for portraiture. I mean, why would you, you would never use that thing for um, reportage? So. My angle on that is, if you're going to use that, then you might as well buy medium format. You might as well go mm. um, if you, you know if you're really that interested in the bokeh or blurry background, <laughs> blurriness, the blurriness in the background. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, so um, yeah, ten twenty four. Um, I don't really use that lens, but yeah, from a filming point of view, you use that lens, don't you? Um, I would really like to see an eighteen mil f two uh, revamp, um, yeah. and. You know, a lot of people have said, "Well, let's make an 18 mil f 1.4," but then it will be bigger. And the good thing about that 18 mil, it's a, it's pretty much a pancake lens. Yeah. I'd like to see the 34 1.4 revamped. Also, I mean, pretty much every, there is nothing I feel I miss no. in terms of focal length. Um, but then I'm not a landscape shooter, and I'm not a sports shooter. Well, I am, but I don't. You know, I don't need 200, 400 mil lenses. Yeah, I'm happy. I mean, 56 1.2 is. You know, people people complain about um that being a slow lens but actually by and large it's the way that they use that so, lens so, so you're happy with that lineup yeah is it worth wasting one of your smiles on <laughs> probably not see paul's worked out if you if you get a question read out we've, we've got a lot of questions to read by the way and thank you very much for sending them in that you might as well ask as many as you can and say in the same email yeah so there's one at the end here due to, due to a, um, a significant podcast backlog I've only just started listening to Fujicast, uh, but Kevin mentioned photographing a wedding in France. At the risk of getting, oh no, at the risk of, at the risk of getting political. Brexit means yes. oh, Brexit. Oh my God. <laughs> Uh, uh, and with that nonsense impending, are you worried about? See, you don't know. We, we're recording this episode about a week ahead of when it goes out, so God only knows what's what's happened by then. At the risk of getting political, though, are you worried about potentially losing the ability to legally photograph weddings in the EU if we lose our right to work in the EU and need work visas? Can I answer that quickly? Because yeah. I've got a whole load of weddings 
on the burner at the minute for Europe. Yeah, and I've got one in France <laughs> next year. Uh, and my answer is, uh, I'm not worried because yeah. I, I would only ever do things legally. So it is why I don't really shoot anything in America, weddings in America, because it's hard to get the visa and, and the people that do just get on a plane and pretend they're, they're tourists are, are playing a, a very yeah. spicy game, I believe. Um, anyway, that, that aside, that's that's just me. And so the, the, the whole thing about Europe is, I think it will be annoying. We, we, I've been reading that we'll have to start using carne cards and stuff mm-hmm. like that to take our gear across that yeah. might be so you know i've got a couple of weddings booked in in europe next year and if that's what happens then i've already said to them look the expense might rise um if i have to get carne um carne cover for my gear you will have to meet that expense how expensive is that likely to be i think they're, they're talking about 350 quid for uh, just to fill the form in really 350 pounds what the f- <laughs> <laughs> Unbelievable! Have you? Do you know what the last? Um, what feels like seven years of my life, but it's yeah. actually only been nine days. I've been <laughs> all over the country, yeah. like literally. I've yeah. been oh, oh, anyway to the, all the glamorous places as well. And uh, on the motorway, and I spent like twenty three hours driving solidly. Yeah. Uh, every other, you know, they have the signs on the motorway, the orange signs, and normally it's like there's well, warning. Don't there's an accident ahead. And, and, yeah, Don't drink yeah, and drive. Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah, seventeen yeah. minutes to the next junction. Yeah. They are all saying. About Brexit now, aren't freight. They? Yeah, freight. Check your papers. Yeah. First of November, things yeah. may change. Yeah. And I'm like, right, do we don't? I don't really want to be. You know, I'm mean, there. I am listening to my audio book or listening to Radio Three and. Bing Brexit. It, it's just know. It, you know. I'm just like I am absolutely sick to my back teeth of it all, and not so much the the fact it's going to happen or the fact it's not going to happen, but the un- uncertainty of it all. Yeah. Get that's, on with it. That's that the is, thing. It's cost us all money, and I'm, I'm sick and tired. Of it's the just thing it's now. and and it's just because it's all arrogant yeah. bullying by arrogant, <laughs> and it's not not real people getting involved. It's well, the, say what you really mean. <laughs> <laughs> don't be rude don't you start um i do remember though and you're absolutely right about working legally because i worked in lanzarote um was one of my first jobs in radio at a time when the freedom of travel and freedom of work rather uh, not necessarily the travel but the work certainly um you you just you can do i had to i'm sure i had a visa to 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 travel to I'm sure I must have had a visa to go to Lanzarote to... Was it before 1969? No, 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 yeah. <laughs> no don't be like that. But, but um, while we were there, it was a very grey area. I mean, you were allowed to stay there. Oh, yeah, the, the visa that's I had the volcan- was... Like, that's the volcanic ash, that yeah, is. That is, yeah. Well, you were allowed <laughs> to stay there for a certain amount of time, but you weren't allowed to work. And um, and the the Guardia Civil little Renault fours that they had <laughs> would charge up and down the strip, and they'd uh, you'd see them all picking up the uh, the the guys and girls that were selling the uh, or, or doing the timeshare stuff. They'd yeah. just be rounding them up. Yeah, and I wouldn't want to return to that. It just seems like just a massive step back in time. My aunt, oh. my auntie, just we we lock antlers on this all the time. Um, but uh, there we go. Uh, Should we move on quickly before we get really angry about? It? Yeah, you got a question? Um, sorry. Sorry, I'm just unnecessarily angry. Uh, Peter Johnson says, Hi, Kevin Neal. Um, battery level indicator. Now, yeah. I know the battery life is a little better on the XC3, but still, I can't help staring at the battery life indicator once it's got down to two bars left and has been on two bars for a while. What do you do for this? Do you just keep going until the end? Or do you have a certain timing in your head when it feels right to change battery? It's like a game of roulette. I, I, How yeah. far can you take it? Sorry, when I was reading that, I had just have visions of Peter like holding the, the, his camera in front of his eyes, staring <laughs> blankly at this battery indicator, like some kind of, um, I don't know, like when, you know cause, cause a when dog you know- staring at a door that they know there's somebody beyond the other side. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. When you see that red battery come up, that's the moment that you really should have changed it about ten minutes ago. No, I just I keep going until it stops, basically. You don't. Yeah, wouldn't that corrupt the card? No, it won't. It won't do that. It won't do that. It's it it stops before. No, that wouldn't happen. I just go until it stops. Do you? Yeah. Well, what if it stopped while you were taking a picture? Well, no, I mean if it, if I'm in the middle of yeah. um like the speeches or something, mm. then that's different. But if I'm just doing general uh, reportage or street photography or something, I just keep going. No, right. Okay. Your batteries will last longer if you let them drain fully before you recharge them. Yeah. If you keep recharging your batteries, then the longevity of them is, goes down a lot less. Yeah. Oh, well, yeah. You should drain a battery. Mm-hmm. It should do the same with laptops, by the way. People leave their laptops plugged in and wonder why when they actually take them out to use them without uh, power. Mm. 
they don't mm. they don't last more than an hour or so. Yeah, hour and a half or whatever. Yeah, heard an interesting thing on corruption the other day. You use photo mechanic. Yep. Um, if uh, and I use photo mechanic, and during a wedding, uh, when there's the, a two and a half meal uh, hour meal thing, I like to go and photograph in the kitchen if I can, and if the if, mm. if, if the chef that day is not. <laughs> Then, um, then I go. Uh, I, I take a little bit of time to go and do some downloading. Mm-hmm. I take the card out of the uh, the camera slot one, which is always um, on um, on raw, and I pop it into my laptop, and I ingest through Photo Mechanic direct from the laptop. Mm-hmm. Um, so I make my choices. Uh, you know, number one is the little pink. Um, mm-hmm. Color one, do, 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 mm-hmm. slide over, and I've done a little bit of culling. Great, mm-hmm. fantastic. I said this to a photographer the other day. Said, "You do what? You're going to corrupt the card if you do that." Because apparently, uh, photo mechanic writes something back onto the card it does. as you're doing that. It does. Um, now, the way I do it, you're never going to have that issue because I never use that card again on that day. The only next time that card goes in a camera is, is for it to be formatted. But if you take that card after you've done a bit of culling on the move, and you put that card in the camera. Um, with all the stuff that Photo Mechanic has subsequently been writing on it, there's a greater chance that it might corrupt. Apparently. I'd love for somebody so, from Photo Mechanic to, to so, tell us about it. No, no, no. True. So there's a couple of things here. When you, the uh, version 4 of Photo Mechanic onwards, yeah. which is about three years old now, when you put a memory card in that is not right protected, it comes up with a little dialogue yeah. and says, we will not write anything to this card. We, your, your memory card is protected. We will not write anything to it. You can switch that option off. So that will that's that's what photo mechanic is doing at that point. So when you open up the memory card directly in photo mechanic, it recognizes that it's a memory card and it says we will not um you know we're going to copy copy protect this card effectively while it's in the in the computer. If you're ingesting it onto your computer and then so now those images are, are on your uh, memory card as well as on your computer. Absolutely. And then you do your selections on your computer. Mm-hmm. Then you won't get that message because it's no longer a memory card. You can take your memory card out at that point. So oh, but I don't. I don't copy it onto the machine. Then do so it. you do your your do selections l- based on the memory live card from the card. Okay. So uh, when you put your memory card in, then you must have switched off the option where it says we will not write to this card. All right. You must have done. Um, it's not good practice if you're going to then use the card later. But if you don't use the card later, then it makes it's no difference. Okay. No. I thought um, it was worth pointing that one out. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It is worth pointing out. Although I w- I, I've used them before. Mm-hmm. You know, I okay. think you've got to be pretty unlucky. Right. Last question of uh, this week's show. Marion Margreff. And in, in brackets, Hubert. Hey, Neil. Hey, Kevin. Um, photography is always a huge part uh, of, of my life when I go on vacation. I would go as far to say I wouldn't enjoy vacations as much uh, if I wasn't able to take a picture. After only shooting on smartphones for the past right, couple right. of years and getting mocked by my brother and his Sony A6000, blimey, that's a clever camera if it mocks you, <laughs> um, I finally decided on getting an X-T2. Um, 18 to 55 kit lens and 35 f2 for the upcoming south korean and japanese trip oh wow that's a trip and a half yeah. it's been a couple of weeks now getting used to the camera i love them coming to the question though out on vacation do you step back a little from the artistic photography aspect and are, are you okay with touristy shots i'm going to give you a strap for for, for this particular one you're going to have one of these simpler straps because um, um I, I take it around south korea and yeah. japan with you well yeah Are you still looking for some big images, even though this can get time-consuming at times? In the latter, how do you manage between making images and spending the the needed time with your loved ones? Also, what is your gear, Kev, when you're on vacation? A lot of questions there. It is. Let's let's do with gear first. What do you take? Depends, really, where I'm going, what I'm doing. Yeah, generally. So, for example, in a couple of weeks, we are going to West Wales for a week, school holidays, usual thing. Um, I will almost definitely take... Where are you going in West Wales? Uh, a place called um, well the house is called Gurlan and the you, anywhere uh, near Fishguard mm, but, uh, well Fishguard is in Pembrokeshire yeah, we're, yeah, we're no, going yeah. to um, Ceredigion which is oh, just okay. up we're, we're near uh, Abergavenny ok nice um, I might just take my X100 is the answer or I might take something that's newer by then <laughs> what that thing that's sitting over there <laughs> <laughs> not that's, that's my coffee cup that's the fre- fresh air um, but no the, I mean to, honestly to be totally honest with so you there we are that's what he's taking Stay. <laughs> F2 <laughs> <laughs> to be totally honest with you the, the, the thing about the pictures when you're away unless I have to produce something for I don't know like a, a, a magazine article or something yeah. then I am purely in family photography mode oh, snaps yeah you know selfies you know whatever that's it i'm not at all worried about 
what would other people think about these pictures yeah. because they're just for our own collection. So that was the other question. Uh, do you step back a little from the artistic photography aspect? Yes, you do, by sound of it. Yeah, I mean, unless... You know, you're don't, probably always using that eye. Are you sticking something on a third or just no, maybe, but don't, underexposing? Just, you know, let's, if it's a beautiful sunset or sunrise or something mm. and I'm thinking, actually, you know, I might make a nice little print in the bathroom or something, then that's slightly different and yeah, you, yeah, you yeah. prep yourself. Uh, but generally, no. I mean, generally, I, 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 I'm just, I'm just like everybody else. Kev, rubbish. you're you're not at all like everybody else. That must be said. Um, <laughs> thank you very much for joining us on on what was. You know, this week we've talked a lot about uh, personal issues and stuff, as as well as the uh, the questions. So uh, thank you very much for your questions. They are the lifeblood of the show. We can't shovel coal into Kev's firebox. Unless you bring your questions to the party, send them to click at fujicast.co.uk. Thank you to our guest, Andrzej Zvakek. Uh, big love to our friends at Simpler Straps for letting us give away a camera strap uh, to the favourite email question of the week. Go to simpler, S-I-M-P-L-R dot U-S. Music from Blue Wednesday and to Artlist with some additional music as well. Um, oh, yes, uh, in, in terms of credits... Um, there was a, a chap you used to listen to the radio on, because uh, uh, you used to do a lot of overnight stuff, didn't you? And I mentioned to him, he does the uh, the front and back announcements on this show now, and he said, I, yeah. I'd like to do one for Kev, please. Kevin's Instagram is hey. Kevin Mullins Photography. See his films on YouTube at Documentary Eye, and his website is kevinmullinsphotography.co.uk. I'm Alex Lester. You can tweet me at Alex the Dark Lord or Facebook me. That's even warmer. <laughs> Alex Lester, the best time of the day show. You Thank have you. no idea how <laughs> incredible that makes me feel, because I used to listen to him driving at 4 or 5, 4.30 know, in the yeah. morning. Morning, yeah. up the motorway every morning to London and it was Alex Lester with his gravelly voice and that's why he said he said he'd be talking about the podcast because I record his best time of the day show with him and he said oh, I'd like to do one for Kev please oh, so are, that's so amazing fans all over my one comes from uh, Eric Delorme Neil's Instagram is Neil James see his films on YouTube at Neil James Photo his website is neiljames.com for pictures and one to one mentoring and you can hear his other photography podcast which is called Breathe Pictures wherever you get your podcast Podcasts. I'm Eric Delorme from Ottawa. My Instagram is underscore Eric Delorme, and my website is ericdelorme.ca. Thanks for listening. And if you want to send some of those in, make sure you uh, also put down uh, your your website and your Instagram and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. And we will see you next week on the show. Bye. Bye bye. The Fuji Cast is an independent loading zone production. Email the show with your questions and words of wisdom to click at fujicast.co.uk. Email any complaints and political nonsense to our wives who will deal with your comments in their own good time and in their own good way.